So fast, evildoer. It's jail for you, you tasty villain. The 1996 video game series Pajama Sam is the best political work of the century. I was myself born in 1996. By the time I was in elementary school, my parents acquired the family computer. This computer would change the course of my life forever. Through it, I was exposed to the wonders of the internet, but more importantly, I played Pajama Sam 3. I have no idea where my parents got this game, I always assumed they got it from a cereal box. In any case, the little French-speaking Sean would be confronted through his computer screen by first an English-speaking Sam and second by a fantastical world filled with talking foods and great music. Pajama Sam, a six-year-old boy who has the same voice as Bobby Hill, was, to me, extremely relatable. He liked candies, had a superhero idol, and he liked adventures. It's through this nostalgic lens and with the help of my Twitch chat that we took the decision to play Pajama Sam 3. I found the cape! Alright, cookies. Your dinner spoiling days are over. I Pajama Sam is on his way. Because now we found the cape, but... I need my cape. And <laughs> I know where is where mine is. I don't need to find it. Can anyone guess where it is? It's it was in the floating closet this whole time. That's where the cape was. What started off as a fun leftist playthrough of Pajama Sam 3 became an adventure of itself. Here is the story of how the 1996 computer game Pajama Sam made me a leftist. By the way, if you're new to this channel, I usually make videos analyzing and breaking down artworks. This video is a special one I made with my community over on twitch.tv forward slash germinal and on Discord. You can join us there, and if you like what I do, also join the Patreon. For a dollar or more per month, your name will appear in the credits at the end of each video. That's 25 cents per video or $12 per year. Every single patron helps out incredibly. Thank you. Our journey started with Pajama Sam 3. One thing I need to mention straight away is the sheer creativity on display in this game. So many elements of each frame are interactive in incredibly surreal and amusing ways. One cannot make a video on Pajama Sam without at least mentioning the artistic prowess of the animators. Just look at this interaction I had with a cool soda can wearing glasses being offered a free dance lesson by the salary teacher. Here, would you like, like that, a coupon for a free dance lesson? Free? Great! Hey, there's a phone number at the bottom. I'll give him a call right now. Hello, I'm calling about free dance lessons. Oh, great! Well, there's a lot of us. It might be better if you came here. Stand back? <laughs> what are you... Yeah! Hello! Wow! Great trick! Yeah! My, my, we do have work to do! All right. In any case, Pajama Sam 3, You Are What You Eat From Your Head to Your Feet starts with our protagonist falling into some kind of parallel universe, the land of Mop Top, lived and governed by all types of foods. The conflict starts when Sam is unfairly jailed by the sweets for not wanting to spoil his dinner. I think I should be going now. 
It's almost my dinner time and I wouldn't want to spoil it. My mom made all that broccoli? <gasps> You can just wait here in jail Whoa. until your trial next month, healthy boy. Next month? But it's almost time for dinner. In prison, he meets the political prisoner Florette, a peace delegate. He escapes with Florette to learn that the world of foods is on the brink of war. The sweets are fascistically patrolling the area and we eventually meet Carrot. Keep him in mind, he'll be important later. Hi, Carrot! He explains to Sam the conflict of the story. The island of Mop Top is in big trouble. Mop Top? Yeah, Mop Top. Here's what's going down. The folks who live on Mop Top are all foods, right? The fats and sweets group has taken over. There's just so many of them. They're causing problems all over the island. General Beatfoot wants to declare war on them. That doesn't sound very good. You got that right. So, I've organized a peace conference. One member of each of the six food groups has been chosen as a delegate, and they're supposed to all get together here at the pyramid to talk out their differences. I think Florette said something about that before. Right. She's one of the delegates at the conference. Trouble is, only two are here and there are supposed to be six. That's bad news. We need everybody or the conference is off. What? The conference is off? All right, that's it. This means war. No, General, no. The conference is still on. Sam must then find the remaining four delegates. We meet a banana comedian, cupcakes and muffins, plumbing plums, striking beans, a fortune cookie who asks riddles, celery teachers, pop can partiers, floating donuts, stereotyped baguette, etc. We free the bean delegate by resolving the issue of the striking beans. We save the cheese delegate by blowing the horn which caused an avalanche. But to blow the horn, we needed to solve three riddles, one of which required us to put a pumpkin on our head to pass off as a gourd. Well, wait a minute. It's gourds only, right? Yes, and he's a gourd. So I guess that means, um... That means we let him in. Ah! And look at the cheese moon through the giant telescope. We saved the apple delegate by making the partying soda cans waltz. Finally, the bread delegate was freed by gaining a wrench from the plumbers, which was only accessible if we stuck a plunger on our heads, which was only accessible by taking the same ski path as one of the plums. With that wrench, we were able to fix the water hose which made the muffins activate the ferris wheel, allowing us to knock the bell and free the bread. Pajama Sam saved the day. War was prevented, and the stream could have ended there. Exactly! In that case, I hereby officially and irrevocably declare... Peace! Hooray! However, Chad and I couldn't help but notice the multiple political themes which shape the conflict in this game. A political breakdown of this game was needed, and to get a broader picture, we had to play the first game. Yeah! Pajama Sam No Need to Hide When It's Dark Outside was noticeably an older game but I was pleased to know that the creatively interactive environment was still a notable feature. Here, Pajama Sam confronts his fear of darkness. He finds himself trapped in the land of darkness and is first captured by trees who confiscate his lunchbox, his flashlight, and his mask. To confront darkness, we need to recover these three items. During our journey, we met show host Doors, a rusted minecart in need of repair, Otto, a boat who's afraid of water, a free market capitalist bridge, a depressed wishing well, a musical room, a singing kitchen, and of course, the carrot. Keep him in mind, he'll become important later. We first found the flashlight by convincing Otto to float. He then brought us to a riverside shack which was missing a doorknob. 
This doorknob was found after passing the show host doors by answering some questions, one of which we could only answer by repairing the minecart with oil and find the answer in the mines. The lunchbox was found by reaching oars in the music room to help Otto fight the current and climb up the well, allowing us to reach the lunchbox. Finally, we met Carrot, keep him in mind he'll become leader. <laughs> Finally, we met Carrot, keep him in mind he'll become important later, after using a tree trunk on our heads to get past the bigoted trees. He would only trade our mask back if we helped him liberate the vegetables from Darkness's fridge, which we did. We then have the courage to face Darkness and, turns out, he becomes our friend. He was simply misunderstood. We only had one last game, Pajama Sam 2, to play. Whoa! Pajama Sam 2 Thunder and Lightning Aren't So Frightening is by far, at least in my memory of it, the most difficult game out of the three. The premise of the story is that we are to face our fear, a bit like we did with Darkness, but this time it's thunder and lightning. However, we quickly realize at the beginning of the game that thunder and lightning aren't actually frightening as we pretty much immediately meet them. The conflict isn't in the confrontation of these two characters as they convince Sam of their importance for the ecosystem, but in the fact that he accidentally triggered a worldwide ecological cataclysm which he is held accountable to and needs to fix. To do so, he needs to find four missing parts of the weather regulation machines. Through our adventure, we see the creatively designed machines for snowflakes, heat, rain, and wind. The first part we found was Wingnut, who was really happy to be reunited with his fellow machine parts by shrinking ourselves into the size of a snowflake so we could go into the training system. We found Velocimometer by rearranging boxes which allowed us to reach it. We found Snowflake Inspector by giving the Inspector Detector liquid sunshine. He helped us find him in a bottled rain crate. He reveals to us that he feels underappreciated, so we give him an Employee of the Month badge which was given to us by a stapler. Finally, we had to get Y-Pipe out of a vending machine. That was extremely difficult. Hey, aren't you the Y-Pipe? Yes, why do you ask? I thought so. I've been looking for you. You have? Why? I'm looking for all the important why? pieces to the weather machines. Why? Really? Why? So I can put you all back and fix the machines. Why would you want to do that? Because all the weather everywhere is going crazy, and thunder and lightning are in trouble, and, and it's sort of my fault. What did you do to cause all of that? Never mind that now. It's not important. You've got to come with me. I'd love to, but I can't get out of this vending machine by myself. I had Canned Earthquake, which I had previously picked up while saving the Velocimometer. I could open it right in front of the vending machine, thinking it would free the Y-pipe. However, that didn't work. <laughs> and we recycled. How are you going to get me out? Oh, I'll think of something. Wait, that didn't work? I thought maybe the game was bugged, so I went to get a second can. I left the room, passed by the secretary, was greeted by the telephone, Hello my little again, card, sir. put my hard hat on to get past the hail, waited in the elevator, and finally grabbed the can. I then did everything in reverse, waited in the elevator, I'll try it a second time. If it doesn't work, we'll have to find a different way of getting the uh, the Y out of the... Uh... Put my heart out on to get past the hail, was greeted by the telephone. Welcome to Worldwide Weather, sir! Passed the secretary and used the can on the vending machine again. To have to use it. It's not working. I tried it again later. I got greeted by the telephone. Hello again, sir. Put my heart out on to get past the hail, waited in the elevator, and finally grabbed the can again. 
earthquake right. in a can. Please now it's gonna work. after use. After use. I then did everything in reverse. Waited in the elevator. Put my heart out on to get past the hail. Was greeted by the telephone. Welcome to Worldwide Weather, sir. Passed the secretary and used the can on the vending machine again. And it didn't work again. But Y Pipe gave me a clue. He wanted me to buy him. Maybe you should just buy me. Do you, do you think I'm rich? Oh, I curse my luck. Did I have to get stuck like a ripe nectarine in a vending machine? What do you mean, like a nectarine? Hey, I had to make it rhyme, didn't I? <laughs> I guess so. I need the solution. I, I, I need the solution. Someone please give me the solution. I don't know where to get some money to buy him. Lucille, I love you, gal. Where you been? I was lucky enough to have a loyal chatter to give me the solution. I had to go to the green chest building to generate something. I didn't know what yet. I tried making an apple, but it didn't work. I tried making an aubergine, but that didn't do anything. Then another loyal chatter told me to make a rainbow because our community is very queer. So I did, of course. Let's do that. Someone said they wanted to make a, a gay rainbow. In chat a long time ago. I think it got it got banned. I, th I think it was Krenna. Oh yeah, there you go. Make a rainbow for the reasons I said earlier. Oh, what's this? They'll be after me gold. Oh my god. Oh boy, I'm rich! That was it? That was the solution? To my great surprise, that was the solution. It was the Irish pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that would give me the key to freeing y pipe. So I was greeted by the telephone, greeted by the secretary, and finally paid to get Y-Pipe. I thought I was finally done. All right, we're here with money. Let's go. Oh, wow. Ow. That doesn't look very comfortable. It isn't. Please insert more coins. I haven't got any more coins. Oh, great. <coughs> <laughs> okay. But I wasn't done. So I left, got greeted by the telephone. Hello again, sir. Hello again. That's it. <laughs> yes, again. Put my heart out on to get past the hail, waited in the elevator, and finally grabbed the can again. I then did everything in reverse one last time. Waited in the elevator. Pat the vacuum dog this time. Put my heart out on to get past the hail. Was greeted by the telephone. Welcome to worldwide weather, sir. Passed the secretary and used the can on the vending machine again. All right, we've got the T, or the, the Y. No. No, not a second one. Okay. Ouch! Oof. That did God. the trick. Free at last! What a relief. It finally worked. In the end, we fixed weather and we saved the world from the climate crisis we accidentally provoked. Now, for the political analysis, there are some obvious main themes which can be identified in each game. For Pajama Sam 1, the fear of the unknown is an obvious theme that can be political. However, the most notable political theme which needs addressing is its very clear critique of property. Aside from maybe free service skiing, which is available in Pajama Sam 3, 
most of Pajama Sam's critique of property can be found in the first game. The conflict of the game, the moment where we lose our Pajama Sam gear, happens when trees block our path and confiscate our tools, tools which they perceive as dangerous for the maintenance of order in the land of darkness. And they could be dangerous! Hey, I need those! And you're traveling in disguise! Let's see what you really look like, hmm? My Pajama Sam mask! Already, land is gatekept, something you'll see happening again with posh British trees. May I pass through? No. No. This is an exclusive road. It's for trees only. Yes, trees only. Now, be off with you. The game show doors limit our access to what lies behind them, but they give us a chance to pass by answering their questions. Every question is easy to answer except for the last one. It's an incredibly niche question which only a resident of the Land of Darkness could know. As Chad pointed out, this is gatekeeping designed to keep some people out of certain spaces. However, the most salient criticism of property is embodied in the portrayal of the bridge. We first meet the bridge through a very short interaction where he asks us one pound of gold just to cross it. One pound of gold. Later, once we finally mined the gold, he says this. Why do people have to pay a toll just to cross a bridge? To Could get to the other side, of course. Rules are rules. You're not some kind of troublemaker, are you? No, sir, not me. He justifies the exorbitant price to pay by saying that rules are rules, asking us if we're some kind of troublemaker for questioning these rules, which he obviously profits from. When pressed on the exorbitant price asked, he goes on to justify it. Don't you think a whole pound of gold is kind of a lot for a bridge toll? Supply and demand. This is the only way to get over to the park, so take it or leave it. Know what I mean? I guess so. He uses the fact that he has a monopoly on the way to go to the park to justify putting any price on the passage. Sam asks about competition. What's to stop someone else from putting up another bridge here, charging less than a pound of gold to go across, and driving you out of business? Hey, what's going on here? You trying to weasel in on my territory? I wouldn't advise it. I've got friends. Powerful friends. I see. Here, the bridge is talking about how he has power, which we could assume is institutional, to limit competition. He's subtly letting us know that it's in his best interest to invest in disabling the competition through power, either it be political or economic. The bridge is idle, he doesn't move, he can't move, he's just profiting not by laboring, but simply by having the monopoly of passage. If it wasn't for this monopoly, the bridge would be just like any other road, but because he's the only bridge, he can make money. This situation isn't only present in the land of darkness, it surrounds us every day. To expand on that, we can turn to Carrot, which I told you would be important because he says this when we first meet him. All right. Is that my Pajama Sam mask? This mask belongs to the people. It sure looks like my mask. Property is theft, man. Anyway, I need the mask to protect my identity as the leader of the Salad Liberation Front. It would be easy to overlook this first interaction with Carrot without the proper references, but the expression, property is theft, wasn't invented by Pajama Sam developers. It comes from the first man to have proclaimed himself an anarchist, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. Proudhon expanded on his whole critique of property in his 1840 book, What is Property? In a nutshell, the anarchist critique of private property is greatly summarized by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was obviously not an anarchist, but still an incredibly influential political theorist of the 18th century. The first man who, having fenced off a plot of land, thought of saying, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him was the real founder of civil society. How many crimes, wars, murders, how many miseries and horrors might the human race had been spared by the one who, upon pulling up the stakes or filling in the ditch, 
had shouted to his fellow men, Beware of listening to this impostor. You are lost if you forget the fruits of the earth belong to all, and that the earth belongs to no one. Pajama Sam shows us the inefficiencies, harms, and opportunities for exploitation which private property enables and encourages. While all roads are the property of all, the bridge isn't, which allows it, along with its monopoly, to charge Sam the price he wants. Throughout the game, most of the characters that we encounter are laborers. Many of them are unionized, some are striking, but the game which most portrayed the importance of workers, workers' solidarity and their antagonistic interests vis-à-vis -vis their bosses, can be found, without a doubt, in Pajama Sam 2, Thunder and Lightning Aren't So Frightening. Though on the surface this game is about climate change, we'll talk about it later, it's more importantly about workers' conditions and workers' solidarity. To fix the climate crisis caused by Sam, what is needed to be done is finding the missing workers who can't do their jobs. In the case of Wingnut, for example, his contribution, though it is small, is nonetheless necessary. Here we are, Wingnut! And not a moment too soon, I see. Boy, I can't leave you guys alone for two minutes without everything getting all out of whack, can I? Hmm? Oh, sure, that's right, Wingnut! Yeah, you must be the most important guy here. There, that looks better already. What would we do without you? You know, it actually does look better. It shows that everyone, every worker, big or small, is necessary for the good functioning of the world, showing that an injury to one is an injury to all. When contrasted with the board of directors, composed literally of boards and a chair, these characters aren't depicted as necessary or valuable in any way. If anything, they're quite useless and don't even match the importance of a small wingnut. There are many ways in which the relation of power between the bosses and their employees are portrayed. For example, automated snowflake inspector, a bit like wingnut, doesn't feel sufficiently appreciated. An employee of the month badge, one of many, is used as a cheap and superficial way of making him go back to work. There's also a constant fear throughout the workplace, either of Mother Nature or by the constant surveillance in the workplace, referring a bit to the Panopticon. I don't know how you did it, but you have my heartfelt gratitude. Sam? I wish you'd stop sneaking up on me like that. Sorry, Sam. Uh. Can they uh, see us all the time? Do I look all right? How's my tie? Employee surveillance. Employee surveillance. Employee surveillance. Workers don't really know when they are being watched, but that doesn't matter as long as they fear being watched some of the time, making them watch themselves all the time. Workers also often feel overworked, as the inspector detector is. Our job is to literally give him an energy drink so he can work. Finally, every single worker is represented as a tool, an instrument, a piece in the machine. They're not people, they're certainly not humans, they're defined by the very task they perform and nothing else. They have no say on what they do, how they do it, or who they do it for. One must imagine every employee absolutely alienated with no purpose but the one they accomplish for their bosses. Hello, Complaints Department, Sheila speaking, even though I'm starting to get hoarse from having to talk on the phone all day. And my back, oh, I'm starting to get a sharp pain in my lower back from sitting in this stiff chair. Um... Thank you for calling the Complaints Department. But aside from the alienated, overworked, underappreciated, and surveilled employees, the most salient criticism of employer-employee dynamics comes from Carrot. One thing you must know is that Pajama Sam has a random element to it. 
Some missions or situations can differ from playthrough to playthrough. I was told by a loyal chatter that I should replay Pajama Sam 2 for a very specific situation concerning Carrot. So I did. <gasps> there he is! There he is! Alright. Hey! Aren't you the same Carrot that- Shh! Not so loud, Sam! I'm undercover. What are you doing outside of the... the land of darkness? I've infiltrated the weather company here in order to expose the egregious exploitation of their workers. What? It's all about economics. I just finished a degree in econ at the University of Cauliflower at Broccoli. It was really an eye-opener. Well, it's nice to see you again. Yeah. Don't go taking any nickels with strings attached, you hear me? In this situation, Carrot got radicalized by going to university and learning about economics. He's been infiltrating the WWW, the weather company, to investigate workers' conditions for weeks and, when we find him, he's hiding as a snowman's nose. Why is it you have to be undercover again? I'm investigating economic improprieties, bro! Here we go again! Don't you ever stop talking about economics? Wake up and smell the coffee, Ice Cube. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. But surely there are other things to talk about besides economics, economics, economics! Economics is the key, baby. Tell me again why you're here undercover. It's all about economics, man. We eventually get him out as we trade him for a banana and we use his knowledge in economics to infiltrate the board of directors by answering what US economics are. Do you know the answer to this? The economy is like a wild horse in a pasture, man. It eats, it grows, it produces waste, and the more you try to rein it in, the harder it tries to throw you off, you dig? Hmm, very good analogy. I don't think I've ever heard it put quite like that. That means he passes, right? He can be on the board? Yes, that's right. Well we then trade our place as a member of the board with him, and he starts working on giving the board members proper seating. Though Carrot reveals his leftist tendencies by infiltrating the WWW and talking about workers' exploitation and economic injustice, we nonetheless feel like his role isn't as radical as he puts off to be. The work he does, the very first proposition he makes, is to give the board members proper seating. Carrot, the character which perfectly embodies the thesis of this video, turned from a radical leftist to a liberal reformist sitting at the board of directors. Which brings us to the final chapter of this video. Liberal Shortcomings Although Pajama Sans politics are often critical of private property, borders, workers' relations, fascism, and climate change, it often falls a little flat when it comes to solving these problems. Fascism is depicted at the beginning of Pajama Sam 3. Sam becomes a political prisoner alongside Florette for disagreeing with Sweets. Later, after escaping the prison, Florette sees patrolling guards who jail her for simply being a vegetable. These patrolling guards, or the Sweet Troops, are members of the SSAM. Apparently, there's a reference to the Seattle riots, putting these sweet troops in riot gear through hacking the game files and writing WTO equals S or World Trade Organization equals Seattle. I wanted to see it for myself, so I learned how to hack. I wanted to see it for myself, so I learned how to hack. All right, let's go. We're hacking. So I gotta go into the game files. So we're in the game files now. Uh, I don't fucking know how to hack. Do I have to go here? Can I control F here? No. Yeah, I can. I can. Okay, W T O. This looks like it's something that I can I can use to uh, hack. Okay, maybe not. I feel like we're close here. Dev tools. If I look here and I wrote W. Oops. Let 
Game data link. Okay. Game data? I have no idea what I'm doing. <gasps> is that it? Okay, this is the configure file. There's W2 in there. I have to I have to add it to it, right? I have to add to it? Is that it? You know what? I'm gonna try to put it at the end. If I write WTO in caps equals S. Hold on a second. I believe it's that, and then I go this. Oh, that's not it. Mm. Wait, is that it? What if I write this equals S right here? Would that work? <gasps> okay, we're going to try this. them see us I've got to get to the food pyramid as quickly as possible I'm supposed to be at the peace conference with the other delegates thank you so much for getting us out of there Sam you're a real hero see you later <laughs> they're right here they have the uh Spray can? I, I don't know what that reference is to. Is it because they they were using gas on people? I don't know. I don't know why this is exciting me so much. It's just right here added to these guys. The 1999 Seattle WTO protests, which happened a couple of months before the release of this game, were anti-globalization protests mainly composed of labor unions, student groups, anarchists, anti-capitalists, environmentalists, and other groups concerned with the growing concentration of power in the hands of mega-corporations. Identifying the problematic elements of authoritarianism and fascism is already pretty important. However, Pajama Sam fails to address the problem in any serious way. Fascism is defeated, and even then we don't really know if it actually is, by a group of peace delegates who realize by getting all together that all foods are important, that cooperation and diversity are important. All of it was sparked by a great speech by Sam. This solution to the rise of fascism in Sam's pantry left the chat and I underwhelmed. Is it really that easy to get rid of fascism? Can we really vote them out or convince them to stop being fascists by giving great speeches about cooperation and diversity? We weren't entirely convinced by that, and it seemed the SSAM situation was not addressed and simply ignored. If I was to live in Sam's pantry, I'd fear for the return and growth of fascism. We've already talked about the workers' relations within the WWW and how they too aren't really resolved, the closest resolution being Carrot in the second scenario, giving chairs to members of the board. However, there's another shortcoming which we felt lacked a systemic understanding of the situation at hand. This situation is climate change. Pajama Sam 2 depicts climate change as something sparked by a man, in this case, Sam. Sam broke the system by pressing the big red button, and the whole premise of the game is to fix the broken system. Through his actions, Sam was able to save the world and prevent climate change. Of course, this is just a children's game, but if we are to seriously analyze a cultural product's representation of climate change, and this is definitely a serious analysis, then we have to look at the real-world implications of such a representation. The solution to the climate change crisis, at least in Pajama Sam, is to fix the system, to fix nature. We've somehow broken nature and, to solve the problem, we have to fix it by bringing it back to how it used to be. 
However, in the real world, what causes climate change isn't, of course, a big red button. It's not that nature is broken and needs fixing. It's that our mode of production, the way we produce and sell stuff, the way in which capitalism needs perpetual growth, itself causes climate change. Sam saved climate change in the game by reverting to the status quo, not by changing anything, but by bringing things back to the way they used to be. He fixed nature. However, he didn't solve the actual cause of climate change, he just reverted it. Once you understand that the problem is inherent to the system and not just a broken feature of it to be fixed, you realize that there is no fixing to be done. We can't solve our way out of climate change. We can't revert the damage done. All we can do is minimize the way in which we are destroying our planet. And to do that, we need to examine how we are destroying our planet. Pajama Sam doesn't do that. Finally, Carrot's character development was quite disappointing for many chatters. However, this could have been a criticism from the game developers. Carrot starts in the first game as a revolutionary anarchist, quoting Proudhon and liberating Carrots from Darkness's fridge. He then moves on in the second game to infiltrating a giant corporation to investigate workers' exploitation after learning economics. However, from the point he sits on the board of CEOs forwards, things seem to change. Carrot might have become integrated to the system he started rebelling against. He starts advocating for small reforms at the board of CEOs, doodles during the meeting, and in the third game, he becomes some kind of military counselor for a warmongering turnip. As a counselor, he works very hard to avoid war and rally peace delegates, but we're far from the property is theft carrot we met in the first game. Has he lost his revolutionary spirit? Has he joined the system hoping to change it from within and, with time, became content with limiting harm? Is this a liberal shortcoming or a criticism of disillusioned leftists? There are so many different elements of leftist criticism we haven't mentioned. There's the fact that the creative worlds Sam visits are ones coming from a child's imagination and that this imagination recreates capitalist structures. We haven't talked about the various mentions of unions or how Otto the Boat was a victim of propaganda and wouldn't dare to jump in the water before we led by example. We haven't talked about the male gaze through the muffin artists who drew cupcakes or about the warmongering general. Finally, we haven't talked about probably the best song in the series, Dangerous When Shaken, which says, Revolutionary elements stemming from this game, from its songs to themes and characters, are ones that can't be ignored. Is this game an anarchist, leftist, or communist game? I don't think so, but I do believe, as exemplified by the SSAM in Police Riot Gear, that the makers of this game were left-leaning. Did the game make me a leftist? I don't think so, but like many other children's games, it preached a certain set of values, values which I believe are important and ought to be spread. Sharing is caring, cooperation over competition, not fearing what we don't understand, embracing diversity, 
being helpful to one another. Pajama Sam preaches all of these, and if that makes it a leftist game, then I'm proud to be a leftist. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you Axel, Mike Wex, Roman Brandel, X Towns, Jonathan, and all my other patrons for supporting the channel. If you also want to help out, leave a like, subscribe, and check out patreon.com forward slash the canvas. Thank you.